I was honored to be asked to speak tonight and could not say no, although I thought about it. I thought and think there are so many other voices, women's voices in particular, who would be better for you to hear from. But you don't say no when someone asks you to share the role Dr. Martin Luther King has played in your life. So I will share what I have to share. Martin Luther King was not a name often heard in my house growing up, although my German grandfather was also named for Martin Luther. We didn't talk about civil rights really at all. I grew up in a very white area in rural northeastern Ohio, as, and as I saw more of the world, I realized how fully racism had encapsulated my upbringing. The fear that is brought about by ignorance, by a lack of what Brian Stevenson calls proximity, was there in my house in sidelong comments by my parents, in my father's jokes, in the locking of cars when driving down certain streets. But I had a problem. I had a problem with authority. I still have this problem, as people in this room will attest. <laughs> and when I went to college, I couldn't help but develop a crush on the RA in my dorm who sported a big yellow question authority button on his backpack. I eventually got my own and I found it. It's orange right here. Although it was the 80s and not the 60s, my friends and I all shared this distrust that someone else could know better than we what our lives and futures should hold, what we deserved and what we didn't, and by extension, what others deserved and what they didn't. So we demonstrated against nuclear disarmament, armament, against President Reagan when he came to campus, and we wrote angry poems about registering for the draft, and we stayed up late talking about injustice and what we should and could do about it. I was getting closer to Dr. King. In fact, it was an honors class that led me to Henry David Thoreau, and words like these that may well have moved Dr. King himself. A wise man, Thoreau said, will not leave the right to the mercy of chance, nor wish it to prevail through the power of the majority. There is but little virtue in the action of masses of men. Although my mother always accused me of blindly taking up for the underdog, or what she called the underdog, I knew we were all really just underdogs at different points and places in our lives, and I had little faith that society was going to look out for me or anyone else who'd been left out of the inner circle. My dissertation on Thoreau led me to a job as a literature professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and that's where I really grew up. On my first visit, I went to the newly opened Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Who's been there? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Get there. I was stunned by the roster in the rotunda, a living list of locals who signed their names and checked boxes for the activities in which they had participated during what in Birmingham was simply called the movement. Fire hoses was one column and police dogs another. Birmingham was a place that weathered a harsh, but in many ways I thought triumphant history. And it was a place that had chosen not to forget it. I met people in Birmingham who told me stories not only of what it was like to march with Dr. King, but to have high school teachers tell you that they wouldn't say anything if you decided to go to that march and skip school that day, to have your friends killed when your church was blown up one Sunday morning, to have so many bombings in your neighborhood that it was dubbed Dynamite Hill. And I met people who were living there who didn't even know these things were happening. People who somehow did not become proximate despite all the activity happening just over the mountain in downtown Birmingham. In many ways, those people felt like me before I moved to Birmingham. And there are, of course, many of those people here in Chattanooga. I'm still one of those people, sort of, but we're all, on some level, one part of those people. We all have to get more proximate. In Birmingham, I got closer to Dr. King. I stood in Kelly Ingram Park, where he had led demonstrators, and where I attended a pro-choice rally after the bombing of a women's clinic down the street jarred me out of bed. That was 1998. I took my friends, my family, anyone who would go, really, to the 16th Street Baptist Church where Dr. King had preached and the tiny museum there, memorializing the children killed the year I was born. I even taught in a repurposed Presbyterian church in which, according to legend, Dr. King himself had, had walked through. He'd been in the place where I worked and taught honors classes. I felt closer to this man who moved me as I taught Letter from Birmingham Jail, 
in the city that had moved him to write it. Closer to this man whose language, love, courage, and amazing optimism moved history. But I've gotten, I think, the closest to Dr. Martin Luther King when I work with students who are finding out what they believe and what to do with that. Go Terrence. Although as I tell them, he's not my student, but I wish he were. Although as I tell them I have lots of opinions, it is not my job to tell them what to believe. It is my job to try and help them learn how to recognize and tell their own truths, to find their justice, and to act on what they find. It remains my responsibility to question authority. Theirs when I feel it's misguided and misinformed. The universities, as people will notice, when something feels wrong here to me. My city, states, and nations when necessary, and my own authority pretty much all the time. It's my obligation to do everything I can to help my students understand, as Dr. King put it, that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Today, more than ever, we need the assurance and, de and determination, determination that Dr. King lived, a faith that we can and must continue to strive for justice, and an intelligence like he had to clearly understand the problems that divide us and how they divided us. This is both a bizarrely terrible and powerful moment in our nation's history. I'm here to tell you that students are indeed refusing to be silent about things that matter. Whether they're telling their truth about DACA, as two of my students got arrested last week doing in DC, whether it's about Black Lives Matter or about Me Too, about the rights of the disenfranchised, whoever they might be, they are taking the first step, as Dr. King said, even though they can't see the whole staircase. So to people like Simone, to Alondra, to Heather, to Rachel, to Dominique, I could go on and on, so many more. I say thank you for having your own dreams. Thanks.